Thanks for coming. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Perry. Thanks, Richard, for letting us um, perform in the middle of this wonderful show. We had sort of envisioned the use of this uh, sitting wall for uh, to be part of the show, but I actually thought you know, that people look at this and think it was not a place to perch for more than the length of the f actual um, films. It was calculated quite brilliantly for that. But the stories uh, that are embedded in uh, Perry Richards' videos and the animation um, were part of the germination of the project, this idea of the sort of reflecting stories and then this grotesque, absurdist narrative threading through them was something I was actually thinking about even before, because last month there was another wonderful show here that we thought we were going to perf uh, perform in the middle of, but we didn't, and it was Su Susan Silas's um, images using mirrors, and I began looking into mirrors and the history of mirrors and heterotopias and looking glasses and inverted worlds, and a character popped up who had a thread to some earlier stories and then threaded forward to our present stories, a, uh, a German uh, chemist named uh, Justus von Liebig, uh, the father of organic chemistry and one of the leading um, educators of his time, who had developed a system for applying silver to the back of glass uh, without using mercury, which was driving people crazy the same way it drove people crazy when they made hats, or I suppose half the people in the room have listened to S-Town and the uh, PBS podcast, and you know that using mercury to apply gold leaf also can drive you crazy. But Liebig came up with a system uh, that wasn't used until after his death. But he did a lot of things uh, that are sort of interesting to us, and will be interesting to us as we go along. But the story actually begins more or less with an accident, uh, a slip on a uh, icy surface, almost glass-like, uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, there was a late snow, there was a big plate on the glass. Philadelphia is in a constant state of uproar, repair, cycles of decay and reconstruction. And I was walking on this plate of icy steel. I slipped and almost fell. And as I came nose to the ground, I saw a slice of tomato on the other. And then another slice of tomato, and then a leaf of lettuce. In this consecutive order, it, even though it was taking place in space, there was a kind of dramatic temporal quality to it. You immediately began, or at least I did as I regained my equilibrium, to reconstruct the event that must have caused this, which was someone walking down the street with a hamburger without much sense of social fabric, did not want the tomato <laughs> or the lettuce, dropped the tomato slice, took a step, dropped the second slice, and then the lettuce. And somehow, thinking about this gave me tremendous satisfaction that I'd somehow looked through time to see an event. But then it occurred to me that I was being somewhat egocentric in my analysis, that I assumed that the walker had been going in the same direction that I had, and that the tomato would have been the first thing that would drop, and then the, uh, but this would only occur if you were eating a hero sandwich, which in Philadelphia is built with tomatoes on one side, then the uh, cheese and meat or whatever on the other side, and then the lettuce on top, so when you open it up, um, conceivably uh, would have, you could take the lettuce off, the tomatoes off, and throw them on the ground, and then the lettuce at the end. 
But in the classic hamburger, which I had been envisioning, the uh, lettuce is on top, the tomatoes are below, and then the hamburger is below. So that, in fact, you would have to be traveling in the opposite direction, I think, in order to achieve the... I don't know what's more satisfactory, more satisfying to think about one solution or the other, or the, just the fact that you could occupy your time idly by speculating about this past event by these three objects left on the sidewalk, which I had almost stepped on. It did cause me to pause, though, and look up at a statue that I passed many times on my walk from the bedroom I rent in Philadelphia to my job. And it's outside an old person's home, a gigantic, depressing space. And it's three old people, carefully balanced for gender and ethnic histories. And they're sort of dancing. They have their feet up, one foot is up, they're holding hands. And um, what makes it especially depressing is that it's a fountain that is never activated. So they're, they're standing on a kind of a platform, and then there's a system of pipes underneath, and there's a kind of a pool painted that sort of faded blue that you're not supposed to see when there's water in it. And then the figures are actually not constructed, they're not cast metal, they're welded together in slats so that there's holes between the, um, the you know, there's sort of a series of, of lines and spaces and their dresses and I think the, fl the arms are, are, are welded together, but it looks like what happens is when the fountain is turned on, they're sort of spritzing all over the place. Well, I don't know if that's in fact true because I've never seen it on. On the edge of the platform that the uh, dancers are on, in other words, um, Come grow old with me, the best is yet to be. It's one of those phrases that you can't remember if it comes from a song or a poem. It sounds pretty good. So, of course, it's from Robert Browning um, and famous 19th century Scottish poet. And it was actually quite long. The, 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 the first stanza is the one that we know uh, come go old, uh, along with me, the best is yet to be the last of life for which the first was made. Our times are in his hand, who saith, a whole I planned, youth shows but half. Trust God and be not afraid. Which was, I think, the, the part that we mostly read. But it's actually a poem about a 12th century rabbi, um, Ben Ezra. And it's, it's a little bit more complicated it's about a man looking back on his time and dealing with what it's called the theistic paradox, which is that his life, although the real Ben Ezra was one of the most distinguished thinkers of his time, this man pondering his life is recognizing that the things that didn't go right are perhaps the things that made his life worthwhile. Um, a paradox which comforts while it mocks Shall life succeed in what it seems to fail? What I aspired to be and was not comforts me. Um, in other words, we don't really know what we want, and we better make the best of what we get, I guess. Um, the other thing I was thinking of is all these sort of confluences are coming together was the fact that the random beginning of the story, if it begins with an accident, would begin with this idea of a slip. And it's not a slip on an icy patch or a tomato. It would be a slip on a, on a banana peel. It seemed like the most obvious beginning of this sort of random uh, history. And when you look up banana peels, it turns out banana peels are, in fact, extraordinarily slippery. I have a friction quotient of 0.06. A tomato has a friction quotient of 0.05. An apple's peel, 0.2. Rubber on concrete, 1.0. So the, fa the actual the likelihood of slipping on a banana peel is quite large because of the gel which forms when you compress them, um, which is now being researched uh, for use in uh, replacement of um, lost liquid in 
joints. Uh, this liquid that the banana peel creates that changes its viscosity is known as a non-Newtonian liquid. Newtonian liquids, uh, as Newton uh, noted, like water, vinegar, honey, are more or less consistent uh, in their viscosity. They always remain about the same level of slipperiness. But a non-Newtonian fluid, like banana oil, or yogurt, or blood, or mucus, or semen, or ketchup, changes its viscosity in relation to stress. I believe the formula is N equals T over Y, N being the parent viscosity, T being the shear stress, and Y being, I wrote this down, the apparent stress. No. Um, if you plotted it, it would be sort of like this. Now, some fluids, like uh, ketchup, become more fluid when stress is applied. That's why when you hold a, 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 a bottle of ketchup upside down, it doesn't come out until you whack it, and then it liquefies, comes out, and then solidifies again. You can make this material if you're interested, and this was another thing that began this whole story. Um, we were at a friend's house and their daughter, Allie, was making slime. Everybody about the age of 13 now is making slime. And if you're interested, you just use Elmer's glue and Tide. It's actually borax is what you want. You combine these together, you put sparkles in if you want, or uh, if you can use clear Elmer's glue to get clear, clear uh, slime and some coloring. And if you really want something exciting, you can add magnets, uh, little uh, magnetic shavings to it. And then this stuff is quite fluid until you, or it's kind of hard until you manipulate it, and then it becomes solid. Um, it was marketed as slime when we were kids. It was, it's actually also um, called flubber. Uh, after the uh, material that uh, the absent-minded professor invented uh, in the 1961 film, which I will not go into, but it's quite fascinating. Flubber is, in fact, flying rubber. It has nothing to do with... Uh, it is a non-Newtonian fluid, but it has nothing to do with the stuff that the kids are making. The change in viscosity can be work both ways. Uh, so sometimes it gets softer, more fluid when you stress it, and sometimes it gets harder. An example of the hardening fluid uh, would be magic mud or oobleck. Oobleck is the actual name, it comes from Dr. Seuss story, Bartholomew and the Oobleck, about a boy living in a, uh, uh, a kingdom who works for a king who's bored by the constant rain and wants something more to come down, and so it's a kind of a saga of hubris. Uh, he's, his wise men invent oobleck, this gooey stuff that gets into everything, and he has to say he's sorry and he's wrong and uh, he's happy with rain if it comes down. Um, you can make oobleck if you want uh, with uh, cornstarch and water. And it's a pretty remarkable material because it is fluid until you compress it and it becomes hard. So you can actually make a pool of oobleck and walk across it, which makes you wonder if Jesus had something up his sleeve. There's Ideas that you can make uh, oobleck armor. You could sort of walk around in this stuff and then it's soft until you get shot and then it hardens and it protects you. Except that's not going to work with cornstarch. So the theory is good, but they haven't figured out how to weaponize it. But I'm sure they will. Um, The idea of things coming down from the sky that we're not really interested in um, or knowledgeable about has an interesting and long history. 
1816 was known as the year without summer. All over the world, the winter persisted deep into the summer months. In the northeast, it was snowed in June in Massachusetts. There were famines in Switzerland and riots in Germany and in Ireland. Nobody knew why, but there were odd results. There were incredibly bright sunsets. Uh, Turner's famous sunset series from that time of the bright yellows is sometimes thought to have been partially caused by that strange year. Uh, it was so rainy that vacationers had to stay inside the whole summer. On Lake Geneva, Shelley, the Shelleys and the Byrons and the Polidoris sat around, unable to go outside, so they wrote ghost stories to entertain each other. Well, so we have Frankenstein and the vampire, the first vampire story, and most of Don Juan were produced because of this cold, miserable year. What it was, was a volcano in Indonesia uh, called Mount Tambora that erupted and spread ash into the atmosphere that blanketed the uh, earth and caused a drop in temperature as the sun was blotted out for an entire year. But nobody knew about it at the time. Just 70 years later, there was a somewhat smaller eruption, not so far away, when Krakatoa blew. But by then, the uh, system of uh, communication had advanced to the point that everybody knew, and Krakatoa became celebrated as the most uh, enormous eruption in modern time, which it wasn't, although apparently it made the loudest noise ever heard, 3,000 miles away, but uh, it went there. There's a 13-year-old boy in what is now Germany, he was a Hessian, who also suffered from the famine of 1816, and it was our friend Justice Liebig. He was no, not the Baron von Liebig yet. Uh, but he began a career at that point that was dedicated to the erasure of uh, limitations on growth of uh, plants and animal husbandry. He was not a farmer, but he was a leader in the debate at the time between the hummus theory, hum hummus theory, and a um, essentialist theory, a materialist theory about uh, nutrition. For thousands of years, this was Aristotle's theory, that plants had been grown by the, uh, the, 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 the they, they thrived when they had been given uh, organic material to feed on. And the idea was that there was something in the organic material that, was, that the organic growing material responded to in a way that could not be replicated uh, with, in, with, with inorganic material and that, in fact, you just needed to sort of nurture these plants with as much material as you could uh, in order for them to grow. But as the early science of uh, organic chemistry grew, certain proponents like a man named Sprengel and then more popularized by the more famous uh, Liebig began to argue uh, that <coughs> there was no difference between the materials, say, um, potassium or nitrogen that was needed to grow if it came <coughs> from manure or if it came simply from chemicals that were introduced into the soil. Uh, they developed 
what was called the law of the minimum, which also attacked the sort of holistic idea about how plants grew, which is that they needed all these nutrients in order to thrive. The law of the minimum held that plants survived in relationship to the least available essential vitamin in their uh, available to them. So it, it didn't matter if you had plenty of nitrogen, if you had more nitrogen. If you didn't have enough potassium, then you wouldn't thrive until you got enough pot potassium to thrive. Uh, he used an interesting visual cue. Uh, others, I guess, after him did. The Liebig barrel, <coughs> made up of different levels of staves, shows that the capacity of the barrel <coughs> is only as much as the smallest stave in the, uh, in the barrel. If you increase this, then you increase the capacity, and then the next hot, lowest stave will become the determining limiting factor in the, in the capacity of the barrel. It's sort of the weakest link chain. Uh, and in fact, this was very effective in eradicating the immediate causes of um, plant starvation uh, in um, agriculture. And it's obviously had a tremendous effect on the way that we grow plants to this day. Liebig had another cause, which was to supply meat to as many people as possible. Meat was in short supply. Something called the meat question began to permeate uh, debate in Europe and North America as populations grew and urbanized uh, and the amount of uh, resources available to grow cattle shrank. So the same problems that we may be thinking about now go back over 200 years. Leibig thought <coughs> people were preparing meat improperly by boiling it and he, he felt that the, nitrogen, the, nit the uh, nutrients in meat were in the juices as well as in the fiber and this was being lost when meat was prepared in open kettles. So he advocated closing the kettles to cook the meat and he also felt like there must be a way to make meat available to more people than could afford a big steak. And so he developed, he thought if he could reduce meat to a kind of an, an extract, a kind of an, an intense syrup of meat, then it could be bottled and, and given out. So he developed Liebig's meat extract, sometimes called meat tea or beef, liquid beef. Um, and it was a great idea. <coughs> Only it took 30 pounds of meat to make one pound of Liebig's meat extract. And it wasn't actually that nutritious. But he was always so famous that it became a popular brand that was stolen from him. And everybody was making Liebig's meat extract. Uh, and they sued and it was held that they were sort of like Kleenex or Coca-Cola. His name was actually in the public domain. It was up to the buyer to beware of all imitators of Liebig's beef extract. Um, eventually they gave up and began to market it as a comfort food. <laughs> and did pots of liquid beef that you could pour uh, and they tried to invent um, different dishes that would um, accommodate themselves to this liquid beef. I d One thing I've discovered which was very strange is that our interest in, in, in meat was so particular that in 1865 there was an editorial written in the New York Times that specified that on that day 4,075 herd, head of cattle had been brought down from, from Albany the, uh, and the day before 5,514 cattle had been brought down and that they were, the, the meat suppliers were actually squeezing the butchers in, in Manhattan in order to raise the price of meat one penny. And th th these were, I mean, they were watching so carefully that they knew exactly how many head were coming into the city and how many pounds of beef were being avail made available to people because uh, supply was in such demand. This was uh, also during the Civil War, which probably complicated things a little bit. Um, 
which brings us to ketchup again. <laughs> ketchup, as we know it, comes from kitsap in Indonesia, uh, which is a liquid-fied fermented fish sauce uh, that was very popular uh, and then became uh, spread across the uh, British colonies by uh, travelers eventually reaching s the Great Britain and North America. But it was not, the fish part became less and less uh, significant. It's basically a, a ferment, instead of fermenting the fish, you can use vinegar and salt and sugar. And <coughs> you would add oysters and then walnuts and mushrooms. Mushroom ketchup, apparently. Kate, is this true? Mushroom ketchup? You've never had it? Damn. <laughs> I was told that you can only buy it in like, English shops here. I'm going to... Jane Austen apparently loved mushroom ketchup. <laughs> the ketchup is just a sauce. It wasn't actually... Tomato ketchup was not very popular because ket tomatoes, you might remember, as a member of <coughs> the nightshade family, were suspected of being poisonous. In fact, there's an apocryphal story that somebody tried to assassinate George Washington by feeding him uh, tomato soup. Um, <laughs> apparently, that's just a, a short story that somebody turned into fake news. Um, but eventually, it was the tomatoes were somewhat held in suspicion. And so, boiling them and reducing them to this gooey uh, mass actually uh, made it more and more popular. Um, I actually had a cousin, Dave, who tried in the 80s or 90s to sell ketchup, a kind of early gourmet ketchup. He called himself Cousin Dave's Kickin' Ketchup, and he wore a flannel hat and tried to pass himself off as a kind of Vermont backwoodsman, even though he was a Jewish guy from Boston, uh, because in those old days before Brooklyn took this over, things from Vermont were considered to be healthy and delicious. And so he went all over the country to these food, um, uh, I guess there there's sort of like conventions where people would try to peddle their, their specialty foods and he'd dress up like this and he'd try to sell this fancy ketchup. The high point of his career was when his ketchup was included in the Harvard Business School's uh, uh, in one of their in one of the uh, volumes of of notes that the students would take as an example of what not to do because nobody would spend extra money on ketchup because it was not a gourmet item. They might spend it on other other um, sauces like mustard, but ketchup was considered so déclassé that no one would ever... Uh, so he was determined to prove the Harvard Business School wrong, but at least in this case they were not wrong, and he went out of business soon after that. Um, another byproduct of the which year without summer was the uh, loss of many of the horses that were... Uh, relied upon for transport uh, at that time. And <coughs> among the more ingenious solutions uh, was that of a man named Dreys De in uh, France. <coughs> the Dreysine uh, was an early, Dreysine was an early version of the bicycle. So early that it was basically a wooden board attached to two wheels with a little padding and then an elaborate braking system. And the way it was operated is you would sit on <coughs> the draisine and then just run. <laughs> and then, I guess, lift up your feet and then glide and try not to hit anything and try trying to work the braking system as best you could. It was actually quite popular. Exactly the same people like the Drazine as like skateboards and uh, 
on an inline skates now. Obnoxious young men who like to like careen through crowds and scare people. Um, and there were actually laws, I think, that were passed to limit the, uh, limit the places where you could ride these things. Um, but technology was on the side of the uh, bicycle and within a few years pedals had been added to the front to provide more reliable propulsion and then a gear system eventually. So that by the end of the century, these same natty young men were riding around on familiar looking bicycles and including Alfred Jory. Alfred Jory was a, uh, a young man from the provinces who, in addition to other remarkable attributes, was extremely small, a tiny guy. And when he was in the army, the French army, which at the time had big hats and very macho um, <laughs> uniforms, refused to let him march or parade with the other soldiers because he looked so absurd <laughs> in his teen little outfit that nobody fitted for him. Exactly. Which was probably just as well because Jari was an incorrigible iconoclast. He was a, apparently a wonderful, charming guy, uh, but a forerunner of the uh, forerunner of the absurdist Dada movements by about 20 years. He uh, he was a, he was an athlete actually. He was a duelist and. He was kind of obsessed with the bicycle. He wrote a story called Supermail. He wrote some beautiful stories. He had invented a, uh, a concept called pataphysics, which is beyond metaphysics, the science of imaginary solutions. And so in, in Supermail, these men are eating a food, a perpetual motion food that allows them to race against trains. Uh, a, t a team of bicycle riders. He wrote... Uh, a long story on how to uh, create a time machine, which was based sort of on the system of uh, a bicycle that you would pedal, and there were like these geared systems in all three dimensions that would rotate. And he actually was uh, quite sophisticated about what was known at the time about uh, the space-time continuum and the idea is that this machine would allow you to step outside the flow of time and you could move backwards and forward by staying in one place. Uh, the thing that he's known most for these days, he died at the age of 34 of tuberculosis, um, was a play he wrote when he was 23. I was based on um, a kind of a, a show that he and his friends had made in high school about an unpopular teacher named Herbert or Herbert, and this Uber Roy, this, which uh, Perry and Richard have uh, accessed in, or, or, or sourced in, in the animation. Uber Roy is um, this monstrous character, grotesque, fat, endlessly evil, venal, uh, and hungry for everything, for power, for food. The story is sort of based on bits and pieces of Hamlet, and Macbeth, King Lear, about a sort of a man groping for power, being urged on by his wife, killing whatever he can do. But it's a, a sort of, it's, it was so, it was presented in such, as such a um, outrageous form that it was closed after one performance. The first word you saw on the um, marriage uh, shit caused a 15-minute riot. Uh, Yates was there and he said, this is the end of the world. This, we can never have, you know, art is over now. Um, <coughs> All right. One down. Um, yeah, well... Oh, I'm, yeah, right. Sorry, drum solo. <laughs> the kitsap, the, uh, <coughs> the fermented fish sauce from Indonesia, actually had a precursor, perhaps not directly connected, but there was a, a, a sauce called garum, 
which was exceedingly popular uh, in, during the Roman Empire. It was made in a, uh, a remarkably similar way. Uh, first you would lay fish guts down and then a layer of fennel and celery and oregano and salt and uh, then some more fish guts and then more uh, celery and oregano and then more salt and then fish guts and then you would let it sit there until it all liquefied into this miasmic ooze uh, which you then would ladle onto food and depending on how pure it was it raised it could um, fetch very high prices but it was controversial because some people thought it was the most disgusting thing <laughs> ever made uh, and some people really liked it. We actually owe Garum for um, a lot of what we know about Mount Vesuvius' eruption that buried Herculeum and Pompeii because when they uncovered the cities in the 19th century they found a garum factory filled with a particular, the entrails of a particular fish, the bogue, a very wide-eyed fish, uh, it was called a cowfish, uh, that was only harvested during uh, late July or, or, or August. And in fact, so they, they're pretty sure that that's when the eruption occurred, which turns out to have been true. Um, of course, that's not the only thing they discovered when they were um, digging through Pompeii. The other was an amazing, for their eyes, uh, preoccupation with phalluses. Uh, pictures of men with, this is Priapus, the god of fertility, is always pictured with a, an erection so large that sometimes he needs a stand underneath it or something holding it up. There were uh, wind chimes made out of giant uh, penises with things hanging out. This was all put under lock and key because it was considered uh, unsuitable for sensitive people. Only uh, educated men who could read Latin learned how to access the secret museums that these were held within. Of course, they had sort of gotten it wrong. This was not so much erotica as uh, a form of uh, fertility worship, although it was probably fairly erotic to We know a lot more about the d destruction of these cities because Pliny the Younger, historian, was on the other side of the inlet of I mean, this sort of this bay. These, the the uh, Vesuvius was sort of flowing into these these cities and covering them. It took several days actually, and Pliny's uncle, Pliny the Elder, who was an admiral and a uh, historian himself, sailed in to try to save some of his friends after the initial destruction of ash uh, he didn't realize that there would be a secondary surge of this uh, volcanic material highly highly liquefied non-newtonian material at uh, moving at a hundred meters a second that just came in just as the boat arrived and basically incinerated everybody was left uh, leaving the Spaces behind, but 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 Pliny was watching this from far away, and in letters he wrote, he describes in great detail uh, the effects of this destruction of the city. Vesuvius had erupted many times before, and in fact, there were a number of earthquakes that sort of preceded this eruption. So this was ample opportunity for the inhabitants to move, but of course, human nature being what it is, everybody accepted what was happening as the norm. It was not until it was too late that they realized that this was a cataclysmic, world-ending event. In the 19th century, there was beginning to be a uh, a growing notion that we had perhaps reached a point of no return in our expansion and uh, exploitation of resources. Uh, the meat question was just the beginning of it. 
there was a notation made that as in in North America as the population had grown every problem had been solved by expansion west in 1816 in the year of no summer the farmers in the northwest just picked up and moved to the midwest where there was richer territory to be gotten in fact joseph smith had been living in vermont and moved to uh, new york which was west enough where he discovered the golden plates of the asian moroni so we have we have that to, that also comes out of a uh, the mormon church comes out of the uh, eruption of Mount Tumba um, in 1816. But movement continued to the west until by 1900 we'd so filled up the country and people looked around and discovered that in the previous couple hundred years we'd wiped out the bison, we'd wiped out the carrier pigeon, we'd begun to wipe out all the redwood trees and the codfish and they thought, is this it? Have we actually reached a point of no return where you have to change the way that we live? Or is there some solution that can save us from ourselves? And the answer, of course, is yes, there was a solution that we could save us from ourselves. And uh, a, a, a congressman from uh, Louisiana named Broussard and a, uh, a famous scout, a man who is all but forgotten today, but I'm confident you will hear his name shortly in various adventure movies named Russell Burnham, concocted a plan, basically, to save America from its burning meat question and also solve some ancillary environmental problems on the way. Russell Burnham uh, was almost zen-like in his ability to endure pain and privation. He taught himself to uh, go for weeks with very little food or water. He could lie still and disappear into the landscape. He'd been taught all these tricks by older scouts. He was born in about 1860. As a young boy, as a I think a two-year-old, he'd actually survived an Indian attack by lying uh, in a uh, a heap of coal, a, a wet new green corn as the building burned around him without moving until his mother found him and went sorting through the green corn and there he was. He said that was his first lesson on how to be still. He was a bit of, more than a bit, of a classic American racist colonialist. He, 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 went, to, he went to Africa to fight in the Boer Wars on the side of the English. You know, he believed he was bringing, uh, as did many of these men, that they were bringing um, civilization and Christianity with them to the far corners of the world. He went off on gold mining hunts in Alaska, didn't work. He looked for oil in Southern California, which did work. But the thing that we're interested in now was the solution that he and Broussard and some others came up with for the meat question, which was, to bring hippopotamuses from Africa to the United States and dump them in the bayous and swamps of Florida, Alabama, and Louisiana, where nobody could go. It was unproductive land, but they could tell, Burnham said he'd been in Africa, that that's exactly what hippopotamuses liked. Um, and that, uh, in addition to that, Broussard was very eager to solve the problem that had been caused by another manipulation of the environment. The river hyacinth, this beautiful purple flower, I think, that had come from Japan years before as a, a gift of a dignitary, had become all the rage uh, in the United States. But it turns out it had no natural um, enemies in the uh, in the Everglades and swamps, and it began to choke off waterways and deprive 
fish of oxygen. And so there was a serious problem all over, it, which continues to this day, of how to get these um, damn flowers out of the water. Because every time they raked them back, they would just grow back in. So Prasad thought, this brilliant idea, bringing in all the hippos <laughs> and throwing them in the swamps. They would eat the, the flowers. And then the harvesting system would be that gentlemen like Burnham and you know, Teddy Roosevelt would go down there and shoot them. And then there would be an endless supply of meat for uh, hungry Americans. Um, the only problem is they saw it was to make people like to eat hippopotamuses. And they realized the only problem with that was that people were basically backwards and uncreative. Burnham, who didn't really care about food and could eat gravel, um, had an additional argument, which was that a few years, decades before, another visionary had brought camels to uh, the American Southwest Desert on the theory that they did so well in the Arabian deserts that why wouldn't they do be a, a highly uh, practical form of transportation and um, and uh, freight bearing uh, in the southwest. And in fact, it was true. They were very good at surviving in uh, the American deserts. The only problem was that they were brought for the army to use, and no soldier would be caught dead riding a camel. For exactly the same prejudicial reasons Burnham felt that nobody would eat a hippopotamus. And in fact, they released the camels into the wild when they proved to be unusable and he came across them, some of the surviving descendants of these uh, camels that had brought in, and they were doing great. And he said, well, if we could just have made people ride camels the way we could just make people eat hippopotamuses, we could overcome all the problems that ail us, but alas, it never caught on. The solution to Liebig's meat extract problem did not come from the continent of Europe. It came from South America. Uh, a, uh, a business associate informed him that in Uruguay and Argentina, millions of pounds of beef were being thrown away cattle were being slaughtered for the leather and there was no market for the uh, for the meat so it was falling into the garbage pits so they set up sl slaughterhouses in South America and had a source of cheap beef which they then would ship back to Europe for this delicious beef extract um, the uh, funny thing is that the the company did very well uh, using Liebig's name, but it was eventually turned into the OXO Corporation. Uh, OXO, I believe, comes from the oxen that was uh, responsible for much of the um, much of the content of the beef extract. Uh, and in fact, if you go to London. Today, you'll see the OXO Tower on, the, on Thames right next to the Tate Modern. If you go to Tate Modern, just walk up river a few hundred yards and you'll see this tower. Advertising was banned on the, uh, on the river, and so they overcame this by making this Art Deco tower that said OXO on it in the windows. Um, it was very beautiful. And that when the, fa when the factory closed, they, they you may know the name from, it became a beef bouillon cube um, and then eventually moved out of London altogether. But so now this old building is used for um, all sorts of creative activities. I once went to a, uh, a symposium on the art of drawing and storytelling in the OXO without any knowledge of the wonderful history it had with liquid beef. This pivot began to South America 
went to events like the, the, the uh, construction of these slaughterhouses uh, in Uruguay and Argentina and continued a policy of the United States uh, to control this hemisphere that began with the, the uh, Monroe Doctrine, which uh, was the first assertion by this country of its control of this area, basically warning European powers to stay away from any part of the Caribbean and South America, which we considered our realm of influence. This was, uh, this was further developed about 120 years later by what was called the Roosevelt Corollary, which was uh, held that in addition to saying that we, you couldn't come in here, that we would actually consider this an act of war. It wasn't until 1933 when Teddy's cousin Franklin determined that there was a need for better relationships with the South, that the good neighbor policy began, when the United States began to uh, draw back from its interference, its military interference with the goings on in uh, South America, and to try to develop better policies uh, that would involve exchange of goods and culture with the South. During the time of the war in Europe, it seemed essential to have as many allies as possible, and also to have as many markets as possible, since uh, so many had been cut off by the war. What's interesting is it wasn't just selling food and goods, but cultural exchange is very important. The uh, Hollywood signed on. Um, uh, John Whitney, one of the more powerful wealthy men in the country who was interested in the movies, became the head of the field office that was designed to make movies that would both appeal to Americans to think better of their neighbors to the south and to convince southerners that Americans liked them. The muse of the uh, good neighbor policy was a famous in Brazil performer named Carmen Miranda, uh, who was a superstar in her home country, completely unknown in the United States until she was brought in. And she began, she's known, for, of course, for her headdresses uh, with uh, fruit, bananas and uh, strawberries and very, you know, everything else, and a tight scarf. At the time, she was accused by Brazilians. She was uh, actually born in Portugal. She was a European, but she was a, a wonderful and fairly progressive character. But what she was doing was wearing the headdress of Bahian woman. Bahia is a most Africanized area in Brazil where a lot of the slavery in Brazil lasted until 1883. And there's areas of uh, Brazil which are sort of populated by uh, Brazilians of African descent, and they, the women wear these very tight scarves on their heads, and they carry uh, fruit and other containers on her head. So she was basically wearing a sort of a, a caricature version of, of this sort of traditional indigenous African-inspired headdress. And at the time, she was attacked by Brazilians for sort of for appealing to a sort of a lower cultural standard than they, they wish to be seen in the West End. And then now, of course, she's seen as a bit of a cultural appropriationist. I regret not being able to bring to you a, f a picture that a friend of Jude's gave to her when she was in Brazil of Carmen Miranda dancing with uh, Cesar Romero. She's wearing her headdress, and he's throwing her in the air, and her dress is spreading out in a beautiful spiral around her, and her legs are splayed, and she's not wearing any underwear. <laughs> but it's somewhere in the bowels of our house, and if I ever find it, I will show you. The, the first movie that she made in the States uh, as part of the Good Neighbor Policy was this Gang's All Here.
I won't go into the details, but they're all sort of about sort of creating goodwill between people. But there's, it was directed by Busby Berkeley, and it's famous for the lady in the Tutti Frutti hat uh, song uh, taking place in a nightclub. And it's worth watching all the... Uh, these women are holding giant bananas in the, and they're waving them up and down. And apparently the board of censors made sure that you didn't, they didn't hold the bananas like this. They hold bananas like this. And uh, the shots uh, from the side and below. Uh, there's a beautiful one where the banana holders are sort of in a circle and the bananas point in like this and then they sweep out and it, you know, it's like a giant kaleidoscope and then inside you see this array of, of women sitting uh, facing out like this, these are their legs and they, the ones on the outside are holding giant strawberries and they sort of lean forward and the strawberries come in at the same time as the bananas fold in and then the legs are scissoring back and forth and it's quite mesmerizing but if you watch it long enough, there's a detail which two of the women whose feet are meeting like this, they scissor in, they scissor out, and then their feet lose contact with each other. And you see in the middle of this perfectly choreographed thing, these two feet try fumbling madly to try to touch each other and they hit and they slide and then, then, then the giant bananas fold in over them and all is obscured. But I, don't, I always wondered when I see this, what exactly happened when they s were going through the rushes? Did, did they miss it completely? Or did they say, well, there's no way we can afford to reshoot this whole thing, we'll just leave it in? Or did they say, oh, what the fuck, it's, it's kind of cute. Um, Carmen didn't come to a great end. She drank too much, took too many pills, went down to Brazil to try to dry out, and died of a heart attack at 46. Not to bring anybody down, but... Um, <laughs> you may know that the, the, man, the bananas we eat now are called Cavendish bananas. Uh, and people like to complain about such things, say that they're not as tasty as they should be. Cavendish bananas, bananas in general, are an interesting example of the dangers and wonders of monoculture. Um, back in about 1899, a uh, Boston sea captain uh, named Lorenzo Dow Baker loaded up a ship in Jamaica with bananas. Bananas, I believe, come from Asia, eight, 327 BC. Alexander the Great brings them out of India and they begin planting them in Africa and they spread all over the world because they're very tasty and they're very hardy and they're very easy to grow, as it turns out. Uh, but they were almost all consumed by local populations until Lorenzo Baker loaded up his ship and sailed to Boston and sold out his supply of bananas at a thousand percent profit within days. Bananas could be sold for about a fifth of much of an apple. You get two apples for 25 cents, but you could get a dozen bananas for 25 cents, which is, I think, about $3 at the time. They're very popular, and these, the, the banana that was um, most prevalent in, uh, in Jamaica and in the Caribbean at the time was the, called the Gros Michel, the big micro uh, banana. It's very big, it, it was very hardy, uh, it ripened slowly, it was sort of the perfect banana, incredibly sweet, uh, and so it was called, a Baker went down and he, f he began, he and his uh, cohorts began buying up land, dispossessing indigenous people, and then rehiring them at low wages to um, harvest and grow bananas, which they then resold. Uh, this all came to a bit of a crisis in the 1920s when a blight 
wiped out the gross Michel um, uh, population. Bananas were now being re reproduced asexually, and so they had no uh, defense against this uh, fungus. And the sort of race was on to find a, a banana that was more uh, hardy. Uh, eventually, the Cavendish banana is actually named after the Earl of Cavendish, who had some bananas that he taken from some other place and was growing in his uh, greenhouse. They're not as sweet as the Michel, the Gros Michel, uh, and they're actually not that hardy. They have to be carefully nurtured. They bruise easily. They need special uh, rooms for um, to bring them to. Uh, fruition before they before they can be sold but they are or were uh, not susceptible to this particular blight so they replaced the uh, the Michel interesting that uh, some people when they taste the cab the, the gross Michel think it's a much superior but some people say it tastes fake like it tastes like that banana candy that you eat it turns out that bananas owe their flavor to a very simple um, uh, compound, uh, isomel acetate, which tastes exactly like you can actually fabricate it, as Leibig did in the laboratory, and create something that tastes like banana. But Michel bananas are almost purely made of this stuff, whereas Cavendishes have other flavors in them, so they're either too sweet or um, superior, depending on your taste. Of course, now there's a new blight, and the Michels, uh, I mean, the Cavendishes are now succumbing, and we're revisiting this age-old debate. There are scientists who want to inject uh, genes into existing bananas that will make them resistant to uh, this blight, this particular blight, and there are others who feel that we have to figure out how to uh, grow or uh, have to grow many generations of bananas and cross-pollinate them until you get a banana which is naturally resistant to all of these uh, depredations. But since bananas no longer have seeds to eat, you have to go through a, like, literally a million bananas to find one seed that you can then experiment with, which is providing employment to people smashing through bananas. Dale banana song that Heather Belafonte sings is a celebration of the work, it's actually a work song that uh, enabled the, the men who sort of, who lifted and threw the banana bunches into the holds of a ship uh, all night long with seeing the six, seven, eight, these banana plants were enormous and heavy and it was hard work. Um, and uh, there's a reference to a tarantula, it's actually a banana spider, uh, which is the most venomous spider venom in the world, uh, and it causes, among other things, extreme preoptism. You get an enormous erection and then you die. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, I asked my brother Josh if he had any banana stories the other day, and he said, no, except for the time that he worked on a banana plantation. I said, what? It turns out my brother worked uh, in a kibbutz in Israel uh, growing that, among other industries, grew bananas. And he told me how it's done. Banana, there's no such thing as a banana tree. In fact, the banana is not a fruit, it's an herb. Uh, I guess it's a, I don't know, it's a, it's a world's biggest herb. But, but the pseudo stem is actually a very tightly bunched uh, leaf stalks. They grow only about seven feet tall mostly. And then the flower comes down, and then the flower turns into the banana bunch, which is made up of hands. The hands, there's something like a dozen hands, and then 20 fingers in every hand, which are the bananas. So there's like 240 bananas on every bunch, and they face upward in this tight bunch, he said, and the way it was harvested is, is that three or four probably American ecotourists would stand under the banana thing while an Israeli chops the banana tree down with a banana machete, which is 
shorter than a conventional machete. And then when this begins to tip, I mean, it's very, this actually can punch a hole, I guess, through the banana stem. It begins to fall, they catch the banana bunch, and then he cuts off the stem, and then you throw it into a, uh, into a truck. All the bananas that they were harvesting were eaten in Israel. He thought, when he began this project, he said, you can only, you can only um, use green bananas because any ripe banana that you harvest is going to go bad before it gets to market. So you're free to eat as many bananas as you want. And so by the end of this, he was sure he would hate bananas, but he didn't hate bananas. I don't know if there's a message in that for us, but you can apparently eat as many bananas as you want without ever getting tired of them. Here's your big chance. It's very appropriate that Tim Spielow sings that song because the original banana song begins, there's a Greek on the street who sells bananas. It's actually a slightly kind of racist anti-immigrant song about this Greek guy who sells bananas, but he doesn't speak English so good, so he starts every sentence, yes, 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 we have no bananas. And it became a very popular, it was a worldwide hit. In fact, one of the most interesting things I read about it was that during food riots in Belfast in the 1920s, when for the first and perhaps only time in the century, Catholics and Protestants rioted together on the same side, <laughs> there was only one song that they all knew that was at all appropriate <laughs> <laughs> as they marched. So they all sang, yes, we have no bananas. <laughs> and then they turned. The other important person to think about when we think of bananas is Josephine Baker. Uh, she was a, a woman from St. Louis who moved to Harlem to dance and then moved out to Europe. She was a very strong uh, independent personality. She didn't like the racism in the States. She moved to, uh, moved to France and became famous in France and in Germany between the wars for a dance uh, in which she wore only 16 rubber bananas as a dress. Uh, and if you, it's a very strange dance. I mean, it's erotic, but it's also strangely comic. She crosses her eyes at one point in the song, and she's sort of doing some form of a can-can, but it, she was a, 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 a big hit. Uh, and she came back and forth to the States, but was largely in Europe for most of the rest of her life. During World War II, she was a spy. She worked for the French resistance, the underground. Because she was a big star, she was able to tour through the independent countries, the non-aligned countries in Europe, Portugal and Spain and Switzerland, I guess. Uh, and she carried secret messages in invisible ink in the uh, in the, in, the, in the musical scores uh, that her band used, and she also hid uh, information in her underwear uh, because she said she was Josephine Baker and no one would search Josephine Baker underwear, which turned out to be true. Um, she started a uh, club in, uh, in Paris called Chez Josephine where you could go and shake off your troubles um, like a dog shakes off its fleas, she said. Uh, after the war, she adopted a rainbow family, 12 children from Africa, Asia, North and South America, tried to raise them in this sort of utopian uh, environment. Uh, she was also very active in the American Civil Rights Movement. She was the only woman officially on the speaking roster during the famous March on Washington. And after Martin Luther King was assassinated, 
Coretta King approached her in the Netherlands and asked if she would take over leadership of the American Civil Rights Movement, but she declined saying that she uh, had to raise her family. Her son, one of her sons, one of, not one of the 12, but a kind of a shady character who associated himself with her, actually um, opened Chez Josephine in New York. You can go have uh, lunch there before or after a show on 42nd Street. And they try to create the feeling of Paris in uh, between the wars with lots of rich food. And I think there's music at night too but I haven't been there yet. Howard Hughes, in the last stages of his madness when he flew around the world and never set foot on earth, was addicted apparently to banana nut ice cream from Baskin Robbins. And when he heard that they were going out of business, or they were no longer producing this, he bought, according to legend, the remaining thousand gallons of the ice cream so he would never be without it. Make me think about the appetites of men who have unlimited power. Uh, what they would eat. Paul Pot ate cobra stew. Mussolini ate frog garlic. Hitler was a vegetarian, although he apparently ate birds. Uh, Idi Amin ate 40 oranges a day to increase his sexual powers. He was known as Dr. Jaffa. Um, Salazar ate bone soup. Companies that Baker founded to sell his bananas became United Fruit, which at one time controlled vast territories in Central and South America. The term Banana Republic was coined by O. Henry to refer to unstable countries that were under the undue influence of American business and military powers. Uh, in 1928, in Colombia, a workers' movement uh, developed to try to give planta banana plantation workers eight-hour days and five- or six-day work weeks and to free them from being paid in food stamps, which basically kept them in perpetual uh, bondage. So the executives of United Fruit and uh, the ambassador wrote to Washington saying there was a communist plot underway in the country uh, and Washington wrote to the government saying that unless they did something about this, we were sending in the Marines. Um, this is before the good neighbor policy went into effect. And so Colombian general set up machine guns on the roof surrounding a square where a huge crowd of workers were gathered for a uh, Sunday mass and open fire somewhere between 50 and 3,000 depending on who you count you uh, relied on. 3,000 workers were killed and their bodies were thrown into the ocean. Uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez in 100 Years of Solitude writes about a fictionalized version of this event in, in the book as part of the sort of endless cycle of violence as the past surges up into the future and in the sort of form of the, the structure of the magical realist novel so sort of the metaphors of the ghosts that visit all of the uh, inhabitants um, become reality. My friend Pavel, who's a, uh, a 
practicing Buddhists and Buddhists trying to educate me in the concept of the six uh, realms of rebirth, uh, which is also, he was describing it as a kind of a, and it's, uh, not as a cosmology, but as a form of psychology, whether or not you buy this as a modernist trope or not, it's a beautiful image. Uh, we either live through these cycles endlessly, uh, or we, um, we experience them in endless cycles in our own lives. Uh, a period when you're in heaven, when everything is going well for you. He said when you win the Guggenheim. Uh, only a few of us can take it, but this is a good time. Then the titans, the, the, sort of the, the titans are sort of demigods who have power and, uh, and privilege and yet want more. So they're in a continual state of desire and, and, and unhappiness. Then the human state, which we would live our, our lives in without sort of the glories of a kind of godlike status, but with the potential of rebirth. It's in some ways the most um, uh, happiest stage to exist at if you're either reborn into it or if you, as you cycle through it. Uh, the animal stage is sort of the lower stage. You're sort of barely, you're just simply functioning without a sense of purpose. Um, the lower stage is hell, where you're in torment, not for eternity, but in some sort of uh, agony, either for past sins or because things aren't going well. You can also stand outside this in a kind of state of uh, enlightened disinterest, but you're also not part of the sort of cycle of being. But this part was most interesting to me, the hungry ghost. The hungry ghost are creatures, real or metaphysical, who exist in a state of intense, perpetual hunger, and they're represented with giant distended bellies that symbolize their endless desire for more, but they're frustrated by the teeny necks and small mouths that don't allow them to consume as much as their desires urge upon them. Before I saw an image, I had this picture. Uh, these are depicted sort of more conventionally with a, a head like this. But this form of a being, a tiny head with a descended belly, oddly enough connected me to an almost inverted creature in American folkloric history, the shmoo. The shmoo. <laughs> Shmu, if you're old enough, was a creation of a particular man, a, a, sort of a, 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 a genius cartoonist named Al Cap, who in 1948 created a very short cycle of stories surrounding a creature called the Shmu. He was Jewish and it was obviously a play on Shmo, but a Shmu was a, a sort of a, a slightly bulbous bowling pin or phallic shaped creature uh, that was only lived to make uh, humans happy. If you looked at it with even the slightest degree of hunger, it would die of happiness. And then you could fry it and it would taste like bacon, or you could grill it and it would taste like steak. You could also peel its skin off and it made fine shoe leather, or you could carve it into uh, boards and build houses with it. It had no bones, so there's no waste. You could use its stiff uh, whiskers as toothpicks, and its eyes made perfect buttons. <laughs> they reproduced asexually, and when they were discovered, they solved all human problems. Endless food, endless shelter, endless friendship were available to anyone who could get a shmoo, and since the shmoos were so uh, fecund, it was only a matter of time between all, before all the world's problems ended. So of course, the forces of capitalism arrayed themselves against the shmoos, and shmooicide squads were sent out to slaughter all the shmoos in order to reassert economic uh, stability in the country, and in fact, they were all wiped out except for two, which were taken to a 
a, uh, a valley by uh, Little Abner where perhaps they're reproducing again, awaiting our return. This became, in the era before actual promotion, such a phenomenon that everyone had smoo buttons and there were smoo societies. It touched a chord that we have not seen since. But unfortunately, no one has found a shmoo <laughs> since. Pavel had one more lesson to teach me, which seemed interesting in light of everything that's gone before. It's the parable of the ox herd and the ox, which is told, it's a thousand year old story, which is actually told as a series of pictures. The ox herd represents humanity and the ox is the universe or the concept of undivided reality. And when we first meet the ox herd, he's searching for the ox without finding him, representing a kind of uh, thirst and ambition for meaning which is not uh, to be satisfied. Then uh, in the second image, the ox finds footprints. He's beginning to note, he knows the ox is there somewhere, but he can't see it. He's beginning to get a sense of what's needed to find enlightenment. In the third image, the ox herd actually sees the ox from a distance. By the fourth image, he's caught the ox. So now he seems to have learned enough to approach truth, but he's wrestling with it. Uh, he tames the ox in the fifth image uh, and is able to lead it docilely by the nose. In the sixth image, he's actually riding the ox. So he's achieved some sort of uh, ability to sort of master himself and his, uh, his desires and he's beginning to sort of merge with this truth. By the seventh image, he's beginning to transcend the understanding that the ox needs to be uh, possessed, and he's living happily, having forgotten the ox altogether. And by the eighth image, he's forgotten himself as well. This is represented as a null entity. The ninth image, he's returning to the source. He's now realizing that the search that he was on to find meaning was always there in front of him and there was no distinction between the sort of metaphysics of the space around him and the world he inhabited. And by the final image, he's going back to town, arms swinging, fully reintegrated with the world, but ready to transfer his knowledge, his enlightened self, to his fellow beings. And closing, I'd just like to apologize to my sister Johanna, known as Nana, for calling her Nana Banana all her life as a child, much to her distress. Thank you very much.